The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Zoning Board of Adjustment will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this live broadcast of our virtual meeting today, October 21st, 2021. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Matt Perry and I'm chair of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so that we may verify the presence of quorum. Uh, board member Frias will not be able to join us this evening. Uh, board member Finlayson. Aye. Board member Hutchins. Aye. Johannesson. Aye. Chair Perry. Here. Chair Sandberg. Here. Board member Softly. Here. Board member Kikarova. Here. Board member Wang. Here. Eight members wow. present. Let the record show that we have quorum. And with that, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system avail available at LIMS, L-I-M-S dot Minneapolis MN dot gov. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Finn Wilson. Second, Sandberg. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board member Finlayson. Aye. Board member Hutchins. Aye. Board member Johannesson. Aye. Chair Perry. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. Board member Softly. Aye. Board member Smikarova. Aye. Board member Wang. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. And with that, the motion passes and we have an approved agenda. I believe all of the board members have seen a copy of the minutes from the October 7th, 2021 Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Ben Wilson. Second, Sandberg. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board member Finlayson. Aye. Board member Hutchins. I'll abstain since I wasn't here last week. Board member Johannesson. Aye. Chair Perry. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. Vice Chair Softly. Aye. Board member Smikarova. Aye. Board member Wang. Aye. Ten yeas and one abstention. Okay, that motion passes. The minutes from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, October 7th, 2021 meeting are approved. Mr. Ellis, are there any petitions or communications? Uh, Chair Perry, members of the board. Uh, yes, we have one communication this evening. Um, there was an appeal of the decision of the Board of Adjustment on 2827 18th Avenue South. Uh, that was an accessory dwelling unit uh, that was too large and um, uh, per code and too close to the north side property line. They appealed the size of the accessory dwelling unit um, or total accessory structure, but they did not appeal uh, the location in the side yard. Um, so that will be going to the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee uh, in November. Can uh, thank you, Mr. Ellis. Can you do you happen to recall what the uh, what the um, size they wanted was versus what is allowable? I do not remember off the top of my head. I apologize. OK, that that's that's fine. I um, when we hear the update, I'm sure you'll include that um, depending on how that comes out. OK, thanks. 
So let's review the agenda. I will read the agenda number and address of the project and state whether it's slated for consent uh, or discussion. And I'll talk about what those two items are right now. One is the consent items. These are items that will be passed without discussion by the board. We will be adhering to the staff recommendation found on the agenda under the items recommended motion section. Importantly, any applicable conditions will be listed in the same section. If you agree with this recommendation, including any applicable conditions, you need to do nothing. The board will pass it as recommended. Please check in with a staff member assigned to that item if you have questions following the decision. If you disagree with the recommendation, please indicate you'd like to speak against that item when I ask and we'll put it on the discussion agenda. So what are discussion items? These are items which the board will take public testimony, deliberate on and make a decision. After the public testimony for an item is heard, I will close the public hearing for that agenda item. Once I close the public hearing for an item, no additional public testimony will be taken, but staff may be, a, may be asked to address board questions. After the public hearing for an item is closed, board members will then discuss and act on motions and the uh, chair only votes in the case of a tie. So let's look at the recommended disposition of our items on our agenda day today. Agenda item number five is 26 Park Lane. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? And if you wanna speak against this item or any of these items that are being recommended for consent, just press star six on your phone to unmute yourself and say that you'd like to speak against the item and I'll put it on the discussion agenda. Agenda item number six is 2704 40th Street West. This is a discussion item. Agenda item number seven is 5321 Ewing Avenue South. This is also a discussion item. Agenda item number eight is 4050 Linden Hills Boulevard. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against this item? Okay, agenda item number nine is 1305 7th Street Southeast. This is a discussion item. Agenda item number 10 is 1115 50th Avenue North. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against this item? I'm hearing no one. And agenda item number 11 is 2116 Laurel Avenue West. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? I'm hearing no one. Chair Perry, um, this is Board Member Sandberg. Yes. I think I read in the public comments that some neighbors of the applicant of uh, item five intended to be at this meeting. We may want to check again and make sure that they are uh, not available. Okay, so is anyone here for agenda item number five? That's 26 Park Lane. As I said, staff is recommending this item for consent. If you want to have this item heard and pulled off the consent agenda. Um, you my name is, oh, go ahead, yeah. sorry. No, please. Yeah, my name is Matt Wingard. I'm um, with Sala Architects and we were the designers of the, um, the project, uh, the accessory structure. Um, and I know that the uh, client had um, spoken with the uh, neighbor earlier today and kind of talked through some of the concerns, so. Okay, let me just see if there's, thanks Thanks for that information, that's helpful. Um, let's, let's see if there is anybody else on the phone for item number five. And again, if you press star six, that unmutes your phone and your phone might, you might have your phone muted itself. So you might have to press two buttons to unmute your phone. And um, if so, if you wanna speak against this, please do that and let us know. And I'll just wait for a, a few uh, moments here to uh, let people do that star six uh, 
Tak. Okay, so I'm not hearing anyone for for 26 Park Lane other than the applicant's representative. And so I'm going to go on to um, items for consent. Let's review the items on the agenda for consent. They are 5, 8, 10, and 11. Is there a motion to adopt these items on consent? So moved, Fenlison. Second, Sandberg. There is a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion before us? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Member Johannesson. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. Vice Chair Softly. Aye. Board member Smikarova. Aye. Member Wang. Aye. Seven yeas and zero nays. That motion passes. And so what that means, if you are here for agenda items number five, eight, 10 or 11, your land use requests are approved. Good luck with your projects. Let's move on to our first discussion item. This is 2704 40th Street West and Ms. Roman. Thank you, Chair Perry and members of the board. Item number six tonight is 2704 40th Street West. Uh, this property is a 6,244 square foot reverse corner lot located in the R1 multiple family district. Um, the lot is occupied by a two story single family dwelling with attached garage constructed in 2015. Uh, per code, this property has two front yards, so one along 40th Street West and one along Thomas Avenue South. The surrounding area has a neighborhood character typical for Minneapolis uh, and includes low density, single and multiple family residential, um, primarily one and two family dwellings. The property is located within four blocks of Bidet Macosca, Lake Harriet and Joe Pond. This property was the subject of a prior approval in 2014 uh, when the Board of Adjustment heard a variance request by Lake West developments uh, for the reduction of a required front yard setback along 40th Street West for the construction of a new single family dwelling. There was a condition included in that approval uh, where the Board of Adjustment required that 50 lineal feet of screening along Thomas Avenue South and a minimum of 20 feet of screening moving west along the alley uh, was required. Um, and that was in an effort to retain some trees and shrubs in that area. This provision should technically still be enforced uh, and shrubbery has been planted in these areas to provide screening in addition to the existing open and decorative fence. Under code where screening is required in front yards, uh, screening shall be three feet in height and at least 95% opaque throughout the year um, unless otherwise specified. Um, this screening can be accomplished through hedges, a masonry wall, or a decorative fence, um, or a combination of those elements to achieve that 95% opacity. Uh, next slide, please. The proposal before you is to construct a six foot tall open and decorative fence to replace the existing three foot tall open decorative fence that currently encloses the reverse corner front yard and a portion of the rear yard. Uh, there is also an existing retaining wall in the rear portion of the property. As a legally established retaining wall, grade is measured from the top of the retaining wall where present. A variance is required for the height of this fence. Open and decorative fences located in a reverse corner front yard are subject to a maximum height of four feet as they are considered to be the same as front yards. The maximum height for an opaque fence would be three feet um, and then code does include that provision where the maximum fence height may be increased by one foot if constructed of open decorative ornamental fencing materials that are less than 60% opaque. Uh, next slide, please. 
For the variance findings, uh, regarding finding number one, the uniqueness of the property, staff does find this to be met um, due to the location of the structure and the attached garage on this property. Uh, the property does lack a reasonable sized rear yard. Uh, the only usable open space on the lot is located in that required reverse corner front yard along Thomas Avenue South. Uh, the unique circumstances were not created by persons presently having an interest in the property and are not based on economic considerations alone. With regards to finding number two, uh, the proposal does meet the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan, um, but does not meet the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance. So staff believes that while the proposed fence would not have an impact on access to light or air um, or impact public health or safety, the fence would not meet the intent of zoning regulations to provide for front yards with unobstructed views and reduced maximum fence heights. These requirements preserve and maintain the existing built environment and the fence code already maintains a provision to allow that additional one foot of fence height in front, in front and reverse corner front yards um, for open and decorative fences. And clearly showing that fences taller than four feet should not be permitted. The fence requirements for front yards are explicit in their intent to limit the impact of the fence for both the subject and neighboring properties. In regards to the third finding, staff finds that the proposed variance would alter the essential character of the locality as there are no other properties with existing fences in a required front or reverse corner front yard with a height of six feet in the vicinity. The proposed fence height would be a substantial deviation from the requirements in front yards within the entire city of Minneapolis. If granted, the proposed variance would not be detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of the general public or of those utilizing the property or nearby properties. Um, so as such, staff is recommending denial of this application um, and I will stand for questions. Thanks for that presentation, Ms. Roman. Could you go back to the picture where the, um, uh, the th that picture, right? Um, the green and the blue for my colorblind eyes sort of uh, melds together. So I just want to make sure that from my understanding of the code, the green and blue for the fence uh, height where a variance is required is where the, gr where the garage structure meets the home structure. Is that correct? So this, this site plan was provided by the applicant um, for front yards. The entire length would be required to be four feet. So if it was a typical corner yard, once you are at the rear of the house, um, you are permitted to increase the fence height from uh, that three or four feet to six feet. For a reverse corner front yard where it's just a front yard, that entire height is required to be four feet. Um, but I do apologize for the colors of that diagram. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Sandberg, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Chair Perry, and uh, um, for your presentation, Ms. Roman. Um, no, I had the same question that you did. The uh, So the entire plan of the fences requires a variance. That was my question. That's correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Ms. Roman? I'm not hearing or seeing any, so let's uh, move on and open the public hearing. It looks like we have one speaker in queue, and that is the applicant, Nancy Weiser. If you want to press star six to unmute your phone and give testimony. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for your time and um, apologies. Sarah was too kind to uh, apologize for the colors. That was actually my doing. So. <laughs> My apologies on that, um, but I, I am the applicant. I do own the home and um, I don't have a whole lot more to add to what Sarah already presented, but um, what I would say is that uh, I, I, I sort of understand this notion that the two yards available to me are for city purposes considered front yards, albeit quite confusing as a homeowner. Um, I, I feel I need to have a yard available to me um, as a private space and that side yard since that is not my it's not my front door it's not my front yard that side yard is sort of all I have and 
you know, the fence height as it sits today, um, I, I sort of highlighted it in the memo that I submitted, so I won't repeat all of that. But I would say it, it doesn't convey a sense of privacy. Um, and if you've seen my property, I am on a hill, sort of on an angle. And so, you know, walkers by have full eye shot of everything in my yard. There's just absolutely no privacy at all. And with my location, there tends to be a lot of a lot of people. Since I purchased this property, I did do um, I did plant about ten trees on this property, and I did put about seventy five thousand dollars worth of landscaping into this property. So I very much appreciate the importance of keeping things as natural and um, not overly constructed as as possible. Um, I'm simply looking for a reasonable uh, amount of privacy within the little space that I have available to me. So that's really what I would have to say, but I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks for your testimony. Are there questions of Ms. Weiser from the board? Doesn't seem like there are any questions for you. So thanks for your testimony. I will say, do you have anything to add to finding? I know it's a little bit confusing and we don't expect you to be a city planner or a zone zoning expert, but um, you can hear what staff has said they can't find. We have to find for these three legal findings. Um, it's not a matter of whether we think um, uh, you know, whether you think we think you've done a, a good job improving your property or, or what have you, but we have these legal findings that we have to find for. And so staff is telling us they can't find for findings two or three. Do you have anything that you could add that might um, help us uh, find for you for those two findings? Yeah, it sounded like for finding two, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I got the impression that there was a bit of a split on that one, that the spirit of one aspect was fulfilled, um, but perhaps not a second aspect is, is what I thought I heard Sarah say. Um, you know, when I think about the intended use of the property, I, again, I'm not a city planner, so I can't speak to that. Unfortunately, what I, what I can say is, um, you know, if from a safety perspective, there's, there's, I'm not looking for anything. I'm not looking for a, um, anything that would create a, any safety issue or uh, any sort of an eyesore or prohibit uh, the ability to see into the property. It's, it's simply to create a sense of privacy. And on the, on the third finding, that will alter the character. Um, Again, if Sarah's comments are this would be a unique exception in terms of its height for a reverse side yard, I, I don't have anything to argue that other than to say um, it, it's, I, I appreciate the view of the city and that it's a reverse side yard for, for my purposes. It's the only yard I have. Um, I, don't, I don't have another yard. And when I purchased the property, quite frankly, I, I wasn't aware of all of this. Um, not that it would have changed my decision, but uh, you know, it, that's a bit of a surprise to me. So I'm not entirely sure how this would affect the community in any sort of a negative way. Um, so, uh, you know, I apologize. I wish I had more insightful responses, but uh, it just, it, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's the only yard I have and all I'm seeking is, is a reasonable amount of privacy. That's all. Okay, Th thank you very much for uh, indulging me in the the additional questions about two findings two and three. Um, again, we don't expect you to be a uh, city planner, um, but any help that we can have is always good um, as we discuss these things once we close the public hearing. So I don't think there's anybody else in the queue to speak on this item. At least I'm not seeing anybody. So what I'm going to do, um, since there are no more questions, there are no questions of Ms. Weiser, I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm going to ask for board comment or a motion.
Any board comment? Mr. Johannesson? Yeah, thanks Chair Perry. And I, I thank you for coming down and discussing this with us. Um, I, I feel sorry for your condition, um, but I believe the way the property is, um, that's, that's the yard that's there. And I don't agree um, raising a fence there. I think natural vegetation will take time, but it'll be a solution that could be there. Um, but I support staff findings. I'd be uh, enlightened by my fellow board members if they have any comment. Thank you, Mr. Johannesson. And I might ask Ms. Roman uh, if you could just do something quick for me again. If you could um, talk about why finding two is not found for. And as Ms. Weiser said, it's how it, it, part of it is, part of it is not. Could you just talk about the part that isn't so that we're all on the same page on the board as we discuss this? Uh, thank you, Chair Perry. Yes, I would I would be happy to. Um, so so staff did find that that the um, variance did meet the intent of the comprehensive plan for you know safety and, and having fencing and, and things like that. Um, where staff did not find that the variance met the intent uh, or where it met the finding was for the intent of the zoning code. Um, so the zoning code's intent is to create these unobstructed front yards. Um, and to really allow those sight lines between front yard areas. Um, and from code's perspective, this is a front yard because the houses that are on Thomas Ave um, face Thomas Ave. And so that reverse corner condition is created here and um, code is, is fairly strict about how we look at the height of fences in, in front yards. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, any other board comment? If not, could I get a motion? Mr. Southley. Thank you, Chair Perry. I move staff findings to deny the application. There's a motion to deny um, and adopt staff findings. Is there a second to Mr. Southley's motion? Second, Johannesson. It's moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion before us? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Finlayson. Aye. Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johannesson. Aye. Board Member Sandberg. Aye. Board Member Softman. Aye. Board Member Smikarova. Aye. Member Wang. Aye. At seven yeas and zero nays. So that motion passes and what that means is the request is denied. Ms. Weiser, you can talk to staff about what your options are going forward. You do have options, so you can talk to Ms. Roman about what your options are going forward. Let's move on now to 5321 Ewing Avenue South and this is Ms. Dawkins. Good evening, Chair Perry and members of the board. Plan 13371 is an application for a proposed variance located at 5321 Ewing Avenue South for an existing egress window well setback. Next slide, please. The subject site is a 5,100 square foot residential, prop, residential lot that is 40 feet wide and 127 feet deep. The subject site is located in the R1A multiple family zoning district and is within the interior one built form overlay. The site is an interior lot and the north interior yard setback of that existing house is 4.3 feet. The surrounding neighborhood consists largely of single family dwellings all within that R1A zoning district. The existing home was constructed in 1926 and significantly remodeled in 2019 when a second story was added in addition to the finishing the basement space. 
At the time of the building permit review in 2019, a site plan was provided showing the dwelling to be located five feet from the north property line and 11 feet from the south property line. An egress window well was approved in 2019 showing the edge of the egress well to be two feet from the property line. After purchasing the property, the, the applicant obtained a formal survey showing that the e existing egress well that was installed in 2019 is only 1.1 feet from the north property line. Next slide, please. On July 28th of 2021, a code enforcement order was order to correct was issued for the subject site. The violation letter noted that the egress window well did not meet the two foot setback for the, from the property line and directed the applicant to remove, relocate, or reduce the size of the window well. The applicant purchased the property after the 2019 per building permit was completed and inspected and was not aware of the non-conforming egress well until receiving the code enforcement letter. The applicant is requesting a variance to reduce the setback for the egress well from the ordinance requirement of two feet to the 1.1 feet to accommodate the existing location of the window well. Next slide. Staff found no practical difficulties because of circumstances unique to the property. Although the current owner of the property was not aware of the compliance issue when they purchased the property, lack of knowledge does, does not constitute a practical difficulty unique to the property. It is not unusual in the city of Minneapolis for homes to have a reduced setback on one side of the structure, so the existing location of the structure would not constitute a practical difficulty. At the time the remodel was permitted, the egress well could have been located in a different location meeting the setback requirements and would have been required to do so if accurate plans were provided. Staff found that finding one was not met. Staff also found that finding two was not met. The ordinance permitting egress wells within required yards is intended to permit unobtrusive and safe egress from finished basement bedrooms while still allowing for enough space to safely navigate around window wells. Reducing the required setback creates a safety issue by not allowing sufficient space for safe egress for, from the structure or maintaining a path for emergency responders and is therefore not a reasonable use of the property nor in keeping with the intent of the ordinance to promote orderly development. Finally, staff found that the proposed variance creates a safety hazard for users of the property and therefore is detrimental to the health, safety, and welfare of those using the property. Therefore, finding three was not found to be met. Next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, because staff found that the proposal met none of the required findings, staff is recommending denial of the variance request. This concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Um, are there any questions of staff? Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Thanks for that presentation. How does this property's width of 40 feet compared to the surrounding properties? Um, the, the surrounding properties are all at a similar width. They weren't surveyed, but pretty much all the properties on the block are 40 feet wide. Okay, thanks. And then uh, just another quick follow up. Is there that window well look pretty shallow in the respect of uh, depth from the house moving outwards? That's got to be probably close to the minimum possible, it's, right? There isn't a narrower one, right? Yeah, exactly. It, I think I believe it's a 12 square foot egress well, which is usually the smallest that we see. So a three by four. Okay. So it's out of the question for them to redesign that window well to shrink it back to the house to get to them. I, I don't know what the building code requirements are specifically, but I believe it would be difficult for them to um, provide a, a well that would still serve the purpose of an egress well if it gets any more shallow. The applicant may be able to speak to that though. Okay, and then just my last one, sorry to keep going. Uh, the in their application they had noted the willingness to create a uh, we'll call it a lid a removable lid that mm -hmm. can support the weight that would would that alleviate the city's concern about the safe function of the egress and walkway is that is that is that reasonable? so 
I specifically asked that question and the lid actually makes it no longer an egress. So it has to be an open egress well at all times in order for it to count as egress. And even if you can push up the plastic lid, it still technically counts. It still technically makes it not an egress. OK, appreciate all that. Thank you very much. Mr. Ellis, you had a, a comment on the building code. Uh, yes, to answer that question specifically, uh, the building code does require a minimum three foot by three foot uh, window well uh, in order in order to be considered an egress um, if you're finishing a basement or anything along those lines, like for example, for a bedroom. So thanks. So sure. if it was shrunk in any direction beyond that three feet, then it wouldn't comply with the building code. All right, thank you. Sure. Does anybody else have any questions of Ms. Dawkins? I'm not seeing anyone, so let's um, open the public hearing and uh, we have one speaker, it seems in the queue, and that is the applicant, Mr. Drew Kerr. If you want to press star six um, to unmute your phone and uh, give testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. I appreciate the time you've taken on this beautiful late fall afternoon to listen to me gripe. Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate the staff's report. I think it is very well done and, and accurately summarizes our current situation. I'm going to reiterate a couple of the points from the letter that was submitted and try to address the three, three areas in which you will make your decision. Um, the first one, uh, practical difficulties. A at this point, this home has been completely finished. The, ba the basement is finished. And while the egress window could be reduced in size, the relocation of the egress window to serve at, in another, to be in another location and serve the function of providing a basement bedroom is prohibitive. Um, in terms of whether or not this would allow, this presents a safety concern. I think the request that we're making is, is pretty reasonable. We're talking about a relatively small difference between the required setback and what exists currently which is a matter of about 11 inches, or if you put out your hand, it's about that wide. So I think that this does continue to provide the uh, access to and from the front of the property and rear of the property that, that uh, is sought in, um, in having this side yard. Uh, and, that, and I think the third third area here is addressed similarly by that, by the, for those same reasons. Um, I'd also like to just note that the, the, the site plan that was referenced in the comments from staff in the staff report is not something that we have been able to locate because the records no longer exist. So while we believe that the five foot was shown on the approved site plan, we can't know that for certain. Um, we would like to have had those plans available to us. I'm sure the staff would have as well, but we can only assume at this point that the, the site plans that were provided were uh, as described. Um, and finally, I, this is just my human appeal to you as a board is that as homeowners, we you know, trusted the builder, trusted the city inspector, trusted the independent inspector to identify any known issues and to, to flag them. And, and it, it, this was missed at several turns, of course. Uh, of course, now in the benefit of hindsight, we would have uh, obviously had this issue remedied before purchase or not purchase the home at all, to be quite honest. Purchase, uh, purchase this home with the intent of having a basement dwelling unit that could be available to guests, specifically parents and grandparents who are uh, frequent visitors as we have grandchildren or they have grandchildren and we have children. Um, I will stand for questions. I appreciate the time again, as I said, um, that staff and the board have given to this agenda item. Thanks for your testimony. Are there any questions of Mr. Kerr from the board? I am not seeing anyone, so I will, um, and I don't think we have any other speakers in the queue. 
other than the applicant. So with that, I am going to close the public hearing and ask for board comment. Or questions or a motion. Board comment, uh, Mr. Softley, and then Mr. Hutchins. Thank you, Chair Perry. I think that staff has correctly analyzed the application. Okay, thanks for your comment. Mr. Hutchins. Thanks, Chair Perry. Uh, I reluctantly, I feel for the applicant, but I don't see any path forward that we can get to all three findings. So I would, I would reluctantly make the motion to accept staff findings and reject. Okay, there is a motion to adopt staff findings and deny the request. Is there a second for that motion? Mrs. Sandberg, I'll reluctantly second motion. Okay, there's a reluctant motion and a reluctant second. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing none or seeing none, I will then ask the clerk to please call the roll. Board member Finlayson. Aye. Board member Hutchins. Aye. Board member Johannesson. Aye. Board member Sandberg. Aye. Board member Softly. Aye. Board member Smikarova. Aye. Board member Wang. Aye. That's seven yeas and zero nays. So that means the app, the request for the variance is denied. Mr. Kerr, um, I think you can hear in the tone of the voice of people that they are unhappy that they've had to vote that way, but we do have to find that for the, the three findings and we could not. Uh, but you can talk to the staff member assigned to this, um, Ms. Dawkins, and see if what your options are going forward. Thanks for your time. Let's move on to our last discussion item. This is item number nine. It's 1305 7th Street Southeast. It is a appeal of the zoning administrator and we have Ms. Brandt presenting. Chair Perry, if I may. Board yes, Member sir. Finlayson. Yes, uh, sir. I have done work on the applicant's properties and have received fees for doing so, so I must recuse myself in this matter. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Perry, members of the board. Uh, agenda item number nine, 1305 7th Street Southeast is a an appeal of the decision of the zoning administrator that the use of rock as a landscaping material is not permitted under the Minneapolis Zoning Code. Um, the site is an interior lot in Southeast Minneapolis near the University of Minnesota campus and is currently under construction as a new three unit dwelling, uh, which went through the building permit approval process in October of 2020. In late August of this year, zoning enforcement issued an order to correct notice following a site inspection uh, there were several violations that were noted, but only the use of rock as a landscaping material is the subject of this appeal. Um, as I mentioned, it is not a um, permitted landscaping material under the ordinance. Um, the zoning ordinance does list um, landscape covers that are approved. Um, any such part of the parcel that is not um, in use as a building or parking or driveway or any sort of um, approved development shall be one of the um, materials listed in the code, which is turf grass, native grasses, or other perennial flowering plants, vines, mulch, shrubs, trees, or edible landscaping. Um, anything that is not on that list is not an approved um, 
permitted landscaping material. Um, the list does not include any such um, clauses um, to indicate that it's not intended to be um, all encompassing. In cases where um, the zoning ordinance lists are um, explanatory, they often include um, phrases such as or other similar materials or the phrase um, may include but not be limited to um, and no such clause exists uh, in this ordinance. Uh, site plan review application was approved on October 2nd of 2020 um, and is standard as is standard practice a condition of approval was placed on that administrative site plan review application that rock shall not be permitted to be used as a landscaping material. Um, placing conditions of approval on applications is something that is permitted under the ordinance. Um, and failure to comply with those applications is considered to be um, a violation of that code, hence the uh, order to correct from, from zoning enforcement. Uh, this condition was not appealed during the appeal period for the administrative site plan review application. And so if the board were to grant this appeal, that condition of approval would remain in effect uh, on this property. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some photos that were taken by um, the zoning inspector showing um, the extent of landscaping rock that was um, used around the foundation and elsewhere on the property. Um, so given that the list of approved ground cover materials is exhaustive and rock is not listed, staff recommends that the board deny this appeal. And I will stand for questions. Okay. Thanks for your presentation. Um, just some procedural notes um, I, before we go to board questions. Uh, um, I always do this for appeals of the zoning administrator. Appeals of the zoning administrator are not variances. They're also not determinations on whether to grant non-conforming use certificates. The board's job is narrowly defined to determine whether the zoning administrator correctly interpreted and administered the current provisions of the zoning ordinance that are the subject of the appeal. Furthermore, it's not the board's responsibility to determine whether the zoning ordinance is correct or should be changed. We're not a policy making body. In appeals of the zoning administrator, we are also not charged with determining the efficacy of city process. In this particular case, we are addressing a narrowly defined technical issue. Is rock a permitted landscaping material according to the zoning code? As a matter of due process, the appellant is offered, afforded a uh, broad latitude in the testimony they provide to make their case. However, since written testimony has been provided for the record, this body will ask the appellant to be respectful of the amount of time they use in providing this testimony today. And when I say that, I mean between 10 and 15 minutes since we have read the material in the uh, uh, packet that was provided to us. So with that, we'll start with questions of staff. Mr. Sandberg. Yeah, thank you, Chair Perry. Um, I was wondering if we could get from staff um, a little more description of why rock is not a permitted material. Um, I know it's commonly used in, in many areas and uh, I've seen it many times. So I was surprised um, actually to find this element of the zoning code, but it certainly is there. But I would appreciate a better understanding of why it is not permitted. Thank you, Chair Perry, Board Member Sandberg. Um, the majority of the reason that it's not an approved landscaping material um, is that it tends to have uh, negative effects on uh, stormwater infiltration and drainage, uh, providing drainage away from the foundation of the house. Whereas, you know, um, plantings have, you know, the ability to um, absorb stormwater and um, you can grade them away from the foundation properly. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions of Ms. Brandt? 
Um, Mr. Ellis, do you, you, you do you want to elaborate on Ms. Brandt's comment? Yes, thank you, Chair Perry. Um, members of the board, I guess, I guess to help answer that question a little bit, uh, some of the rationales behind it, um, there are quite a, uh, quite a few. Uh, it stems heavily from, originally from the kind of commercial development. Uh, we would see a lot of problems with rock getting out onto the sidewalk, um, especially the public sidewalk or out in the street um, where it can cause issues if people are using mechanical snow removal, things like that. Um, and also, um, I mean, to be honest, one of the one of the issues is traditionally, um, you know, just trying to minimize the amount of rocks that are available that can be weaponized or used or thrown. Um, you know, one of the ex um, it's been a standard condition of approval on a lot of things that have gone to the planning commission. Um, and then, kind of recently, we've seen a more uptick um, in its use um, it, with new construction. Traditionally, you know, we, it is a very common landscaping material. You know, very heavily used. Um, and, you know, we don't see it a lot on older things that people redo their things because we're complaint based. So we tend to catch it in situations like this where we have a site plan review and we've reviewed something and then the inspector goes out. And so we do have um, concerns, especially um, when it broadens out beyond your sort of normal landscaping and it just becomes, you know, sort of fills an entire side yard um, because again, the goal of the code here is to have as much infiltration as possible to have uh, green space, whether that is turf grass or native plantings or other sorts of plantings. Um, that's kind of the goal behind that. So I hope that helped flesh out uh, the, the answer a little bit uh, for you. Um, and I believe Alyssa had addressed a little bit of that in the report as well. Ms. Brandt. Okay, and are there any other questions of staff? I don't see any, so let's open the public hearing and we have uh, in queue um, four people. I'll call your names and if you could give your name and address for the record, I would appreciate it. Uh, our first person who is signed up is an applicant, and that is Mr. Tim Harms Harmson. If you could press your star six on your phone to unmute it. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, is this Mr. Harmson? Hi, my name yes, yeah, my name is Tim Harmson, and I live at 74 East Golden Lake Road in Circle Pines, Minnesota. And my wife and I own Dinky Town Rentals, and we built that building to replace an older, blighted, smaller structure. And our intention was not to circumvent the rules, it was just to produce a, a beautifully well landscaped, well maintained new property. And we didn't give it a whole lot of thought at the time. And we switched to rock because our experience with mulch is that it it doesn't provide any long lasting coverage. And within a year or so, it's, it's, it tends to kind of disintegrate. And so we also had noticed that lots of the buildings right around there have rock and they use rock to cover, especially around the foundations where you do get these areas of, of, of kind of messy stuff and it's hard to keep them clean. And and we and that's what we're really trying to do. We've got uh, Glenn Rank um, willing to talk, and he's got some more technical ideas regarding rodent infestation. And then I think William Wells, the architect, has also got a comment to make. But that's all that I would have to say. And I thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Okay. Um, are there any questions of Mr. Harmson? And again, remember, we're we're not looking. As I said at the beginning, the code is what the code is, um, and so we have to determine whether the zoning administrator made the right call, that, or whether he didn't. And so I think if you could focus your comments around that, that would be helpful. Um, as well as questions from the board. Uh, our next, next speaker in queue is Mr. Justin Jacobs. If you could press star six to unmute your phone. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Please proceed. Well, thank you, board. And Good could you give your address? Could you give your address to, too? Well, uh, I'm the builder for the property. Our office address is 7103 Highway 65 in Fridley. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'd, I have a few points I'd like to make in regards to this issue. Number one being we have 89 documents right now in our project docs file for this project. That includes applications, contracts that had to be signed, engineering documents, architectural documents, approved city plans, approved city permits, everything imaginable to build a three, a, a three unit triplex. These, these consist of hundreds of pages of documents. In all of those documents, in everything that's stamped by the city and everything we have to, to sign, nowhere anywhere does it say anything about rock not being permitted aside from one page in one document at the very bottom of the zoning approval letter there's one line that says rock is not permitted. Okay. Now, if rock was such a major issue with the city, you'd think that there'd be a little bit more emphasis in the approved plans in the documents that were required to sign to build this project to emphasize that rock is not allowed as a pervious surface because we all know rock is a very pervious surface. In addition, I'd like to point out to the board the fact that that statement in the zoning approval letter that rock is not permitted directly contradicts the actual Minneapolis code ordinance on the subject. The ordinance of Minneapolis specifically allows for mulch. Rock by definition is a mulch and you can call any landscaper or landscape architect in the Twin Cities and ask them if rock is an approved mulch and they will say it is absolutely considered a mulch. If you look at Merriam-Webster's dictionary definition of mulch, which has been the, the source of definition since 1828, the actual definition of mulch is a protective covering, spreader left on the ground to reduce evaporation, maintain even soil temperature, prevent erosion, control weeds, enrich the soil, or keep fruit clean. That is the dictionary definition and rock meets every single aspect of that definition. If we go to the nation's leading expert in building and landscape, um, Bob Vila, Bob Vila has an entire article on his website about mulch. And he says this, various types of mulch material do not decompose and therefore do not need to be replenished very often to Mr. Tim Harmson's point. These options include rock, stone, lava rock, and he goes on to list several others. And then he goes into all the benefits of having a mulch Specifically, he calls rock a mulch, all the benefits of having a mulch like this down. If you go to spruce.com's website, they list the most common kinds of mulch that are used in North America. And number seven on their list is stone. Number 11 is crushed sea seashell. Number three is cocoa hulls. It, it, it's my contention board that the ordinance, if the city of Minneapolis truly doesn't want rock to be included as a ground covering, the ordinance must be rewritten because the ordinance specifically allows for rock. It specifically leaves, calls out that mulch is an approved ground covering and mulch or rock by definition is absolutely considered a mulch. And I think that's where the confusion came in when the owner decided he'd rather have rock down as a more permanent ground covering, we all got together with the architect on the property and said, can we do this? And we agreed, absolutely. It's a pervious, it's a pervious material. And, you know, um, I think the document that was submitted, the zoning approval letter that was submitted a year ago, you know, we obviously received that. Um, we obviously read that. I don't recall seeing the line item about rock not being approved, but I guess my greatest argument would be that that line item in the approval letter completely contradicts what the ordinance actually reads. And I think that's where the confusion is coming in here on this issue. Okay, anything else to add? That's my argument. Okay, are there, um, you're also listed as uh, part of the applicant team. So I'll give you, give the board an opportunity to ask you any questions. Does the board have any questions of Mr. Jacobs? I'm not seeing any. Thanks for your testimony. 
uh, next in line. And again, if you give your name and address for the record is Mr. William Wells. Press star six to unmute your phone. Mr. Wells. Let's move on to Mr. Uh, Glenn. Yes, are you, is this Mr. Wells? Hi, I'm sorry, I was pushing the wrong button. Okay, great. My name is William Wells. I am the architect on the project. Address is uh, 18 North 12th Street Suite. Uh, 3961 Minneapolis, Minnesota 55403. I did work on this project and I was responsible for submitting the site plan review application to the city of Minneapolis. I have that in front of me where they have the design standards and the point system that I signed the letter. I have reviewed this letter. I do not see anywhere on it or on the application that I submitted where it says we can't use rock uh, as a mulch covering. I can't find that anywhere. I looked through the PDR documents. I can't find it on the PDR documents the uh, construction management agreement, the permit. I, I, as the architect, never saw anything from the city that said we can't use rock as a, as a mulch material. Uh, I think that there was a letter that went to uh, the contractor with a line item, but it never went to me or the owner as the architect. So we never saw it and we would have addressed it. We would have addressed it if I had I seen it, but staff didn't send it to me. That's, that's an administrative mistake to not copy me, the architect, and send that to me. That never happened. That's an important point, that there's a failure and a breakdown of the process here of communication that, that staff needs to own. I would like to point out a couple other things. I completely agree with the contractor. I called other landscape architects today and asked them what the definition of mulch is and told them about this project. They told me the same thing, that small stones and rocks are a mulch covering. And it is used and it is in compliance with the zoning code. And I called other architects and landscape architects today. They were shocked by this situation because rocks are being used on other projects, new homes in the city of Minneapolis. There, there are butterfly gardens, rock gardens, and duplexes and single family homes all over South Minneapolis. That This is, this is a mistake what's happened here tonight. And there's an opportunity to correct it. Staff has said that the rocks don't drain uh, that is not true. The rocks do drain and uh, it's no different than if we put down um, a cedar mulch in that area. It, there's no difference in the drainage. So to that point, they're wrong. That's not correct. They're saying that the tenants use them as weapons and throw them. That's never happened. Never. There are no reports, no problems of students. There's a student residents, University of Minnesota student residents. They don't throw rocks. Uh, it, it's not happening. There's no police reports. There's nothing. There's no evidence. Staff has presented absolutely no evidence to the board to support what they're saying about drainage or weapons. That's completely incorrect. This this is a material that looks good. It improves the property. It's an upgrade. Uh, I agree with what the uh, what the uh, contractor and owner have installed. I think it looks really good. I think it's a sustainable material that will look good year round. The, the problem that staff seems to have is the amount of rocks that was a, that was installed in the side yard. That is something that caught my caught my attention as potentially reasonable. The amount of rocks in the side yard where it's draining next to the neighbor. That is one point that I would listen to them. If some of the rocks in the side yard needed to be removed, that would be towards the uh, that would be towards the west. I need to move some better drainage. I think we would listen to them because that'd be reasonable. But it, as far as I'm concerned, the contractor is in compliance with installing rocks as a mulch because it meets the definition of mulch. Uh, and if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Thanks for your testimony. Are there any questions of Mr. Wells? I don't see any. Um, Again, thanks for your testimony. And finally, we have Mr. Glenn Rank. If you could give your address for the record and if you could press star six to unmute your phone. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, Board Members, and Ms. Grant. Um, we 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 appreciate your time today. I will be very brief. Um, I I just wanted to let everyone know that that we're constantly working on reengineering all of our all of our projects through the construction process. This was in no way meant as as something that where we wanted to flaunt the the authority of anyone or anything else. We just we came upon an opportunity to improve the property. It was actually more expense. Other than this money saving, it was just more expense to make it nicer and make it better. It matched the uh, property next door. As you can see from the photos there, the green space that was actually created between the two buildings is beautiful and the, and the rock on both sides and, and all of the green in the middle really, really turned out nicely. But this was in no way um, it, 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 something where we were trying to circumvent anyone's authority or circumvent any process. And uh, w with that, we're, 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 Tim mentioned earlier, um, we're always looking at, at mitigating problems. Rodents are a problem in a densely populated urban area. And um, we're working with our, with, working with our uh, Pest control companies, they always recommend that we clean up and, and have have um, something such as gravel or concrete next to the building to to help with that problem. So those, those are some of the reasons that this was being done, but it matches exactly what's on the building that about, that, that is right next door and that really it 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 um, creates a really nice uh, entryway and walkway into that area and with that uh i'm i'm open for any questions but that that's what i had to say okay thanks for your testimony uh are there any questions of mr rank all right um before we close the public hearing, uh, Mr. Sandberg has a question of staff. Yeah, thank you, Chair Perry. I guess I'd like to he hear a little more from staff about the um, distinguishing mulch from rock and whether uh, what the definition of mulch is in the zoning code and how they came to exclude rock from uh, the word mulch in the zoning code. Thank you, Chair Perry, Board Member Sandberg. Um, the zoning code does not explicitly define the word mulch, um, but it does say that where words are not explicitly defined, then the, the common uh, definition shall prevail. Um, so using the common um, definition of, of mulch would be um, the appropriate path forward. Um, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Jacobs did list out the, the definition of mulch, and I think that whether or not um, you know, tree mulch and rock mulch are encapsulated within that is sort of the, the material of the discussion here. Yeah, so, um, this is Brad Ellis, so Chair Perry, um, uh, Board Member Sandberg. Um, we do tend to go to the dictionary definition of things, um, as Ms. Brandt noted. Um, and so the definition, um, I don't have the one that zoning administrator has in his office, unfortunately, but it is the Merriam-Webster. Um, a protective covering as of sawdust, compost, or paper spread or left on the ground to reduce evaporation, maintain even soil temperature, prevent erosion, control weeds, enrich the soil, or keep fruits such as strawberries clean. Um, so like our, our commonly held definition in the code is, or I mean, it's not in the zoning code, but it is basically um, organic mulch, uh, primarily bark um, is, is what we'd like to see, the various forms of uh, wood or wood chips. Um, but that, that's the best I can, I can give you in terms of like the rationale and thought process behind it. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no questions of any of our speakers, then I will close. The, are there any questions of the speakers or the people who testified? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and go to board comment. We've already had a question of staff. 
Um, again, I just want to, uh, before I call on Ms. Wang, who has a comment, I want to reiterate, um, there's been some questions about the efficacy of the process. Again, that's not in our purview. Um, our, there's been some question about whether there should, ROC should be involved, be a part of the definition. That's a policy decision. It may very well be uh, an appropriate material uh, to be included explicitly, um, but it's, we, we have to determine whether the zoning administrator made the right call with the words that are in the zoning code. So um, we can't, add words that are not there uh, since we're not a policy making body. Uh, so with that, Ms. Wang. Yeah, so to my understanding, a rock is a mulch, manure could also be classified as a mulch. So outside of semantics, I'm having a lot of trouble understanding staff findings and this nuanced reason because of that definition of rocks versus mulch. And it makes me wonder at that really nuanced differentiation, if there's like a commercial versus residential properties factor that was, you know, needed to be included into it that was missing in that letter Mr. Jacobs was referring to. So I'm really leaning towards um, not supporting staff findings. Um, but again, I'm having a lot of trouble kind of understanding it. So if um, one of my fellow board members have anything to add to that, that would be really helpful. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wang. Other comments or questions? Mr. Hutchins? And then Mr. Thanks, Sandberg. Sir. So I, uh, I currently work for a facility that does training and it also offers a landscaping course. And I was curious about this and I went and read uh, our chapter about landscaping and mulch. It absolutely had rock and crushed stone as a mulch product out of a textbook. So that's just to leave that here. I am I'm uh, kind of veering towards Miss Wang's argument that I think we would, uh, I would support a motion to uh, reject staff findings. Mr. Sandberg. Yeah, thank you, Chair Perry. Um, I think with the ambiguity in the zoning code definition, I would not support the decision of the zoning administrator on that. The fact that the um, applicant or the, and the builder got a letter uh, specifically excluding rock as a material, a landscaping material. I think I could certainly support the zoning administrator's decision that this property is not compliant with that. Thanks for that comment. Um, maybe staff can illuminate us uh, to with Mr. Uh, Sandberg's comment, um, the applicant, the applicant's team, some of them got um, information that said rock was not permitted and some did not get any clarification uh, on that. Can you tell us why that was and who gets what? Thank you, Chair Perry. Uh, standard protocol is to upload the approved site plan review uh, approval letter into the, uh, the permitting uh, online portal that we have. Um, and then when the permit is, the building permit is ready to be issued, the applicant gets um, you know, all of the stamped plans, all of the um, approval letters from, from zoning and building code staff, um, all as one um, to go through and um, have at their disposal and to keep on site. So you're saying that uh, Mr. Jacobs should have seen this uh, statement that rock was not an approved material? Yes, it is in the approved folder within the building permit in their per in, in our online permitting portal. Okay. Um, so 
Um, Mr. Ellis, I think it would be important. Um, it, it seems like um, from Mr. Sandberg's comment that um, or, or observation that there was a information that was given to the applicants team that said rock was not approved that somewhere else there must be some information that says that rock is not um, a mulch a, a part of mulch uh, notwithstanding what mr hutchins and um, others may have gotten through dictionary definitions so can you help me out a little bit with that Yes, Chair Perry, I think this one gets extra confusing uh, on, on a wide variety of levels because, you know, we're not, we weren't going to, you know, not allow an appeal at this point. Um, if you want to be very, very technical, when we had that condition of approval, the appeal should have occurred at that time, um, you know, saying that we don't have the authority, but, you know, it, it occurred retroactively. But of course, we're going to allow the appeal to go in because they need to have their ability to, you know, refute the city's findings. So, you know, it, it's an interesting thing that even, I mean, technically, even if the board found that we, you know, have to accept rock as a landscaping material, um, you know, that condition of approval is on there and was accepted because it wasn't appealed. Um, I don't think we would be so overly bureaucratic as to say, you know that that condition if the if the board decides you know to not uphold the decision of the zoning administrator in terms of like our authority uh under that clause noted uh in the site plan review chapter where we reference it um we wouldn't be able to hold necessarily them to that condition because essentially um you know the condition would be arbitrary i mean we could do it but I, I could see, you know, if it, if it went to court or something along those lines, it just seems like an arbitrary decision if we're not basing it upon the code. Um, so we would, in that case, relent on that condition of approval should the board find that the we uh, did not or had misinterpreted what mulch means in the code. So, I, does that help? A little bit. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of. Um, of course, other board members can chime in, but I'm. Um, Mr. Sandberg has brought up an interesting comment, which is the, the city has, whereas Mr. Mr. Hutchins has read in his landscape section that rock is a landscape, is a, is a mulch, and the applicant or the appellant and their team say the same thing. Um, we get this thing in the the the, app, the appellant gets in their in their package that rock is not permitted so it seems like the city really means that mulch does not include rock that that is correct uh chair perry the the city's the way the city defines mulch or at least in the way we have interpreted our code uh, in the subset in the in the clause called out where the what the permitted landscaping materials we do not include rock under mulch and, and what the app what the appellant is arguing is that rock should be included under mulch um, and so that that is how we've done it and it's one of the reasons we um, we didn't used to have it as a standard condition of approval although we had enforced it it was only in the it recently we've seen it start to be used um, in more of a filling an entire side yard sort of uh, method, uh, at which point it becomes a, a less of a of a landscaping material in terms of you know you're using it as an area for planting and it's just sort of a ground cover at that point, uh, which becomes more of a problem. Um, that being said, uh, I, I hope I'm explaining that in, in the sense that the city's position is that rock is not included under mulch um, as it's outlined under the code as a permitted a, a uh, material um, and so the appeal essentially has focused on that. I know Mr. Wells and and the other appellants have um, have have expressed that rock should be allowed under mulch, and so that that's kind of what ends up being the core of the argument here. So the sure. position is that mulch to us meant more like an organic material. Okay. All right. Um, any other board members have comments? or questions or a motion.
Ms. Wang. Hi, I'd like to make a motion to reject staff findings. Okay, um, if if I can get, um, I, I think you need to provide a reason why. I, so I, I think this is a part that I'm struggling a little bit too, is I, can I, can you give me a second? Sure. Because in, in fact, you're finding for the appellant, you need to have some reason why the rejection, you're rejecting the staff finding. Ms. Smakarva, you have Hi, a comment? Um, I do. I wonder if it, it sounds almost like um, the, I don't say common or working, but it sounds like at the time that the zoning administration, administrator made the ruling or what have you, that the definition of mulch has evolved since then or had evolved, but the code hadn't. And I don't think, I know we're not trying to change code or write policy, but I think there's something, um, I think at the time that the administrator made their ruling, they based it on the existing code and they, they did not, they did not make a ruling correctly based on the code as it was written because the code was written in a way that kind of expired or had, had evolved. And so the terminology of mulch and the definition of mulch had already evolved past that. And so I think at the time they made the ruling, it did not match the definition of mulch. And I just want to add a quick comment and that summarized my thoughts exactly. Um, which is maybe perhaps it's not actually a motion, but I think I'm at a loss here of what is appropriate. And I see that Mr. Ellis has commented on something, so I'll just wait for that. Okay. Um, Mr. Ellis, do you want to chime in here? Uh, certainly, Chair Perry. I guess um, what uh, uh, Board Member Taylor and Board Member Smikarova um, should really focus on if you are going to, uh, you know, rule against staff findings. Again, I think it, it is foc it, the correct thing to do would just kind of explain how the zoning administrator is misinterpreting that ex that specific word. Um, is what you would is what you would call on if so um, you know legally that's how you would ad address that to say we believe that the applicant is correct that the word mulch does incorporate you know does encompass a larger variety of materials than has been uh, proposed by the zoning administrator something along those lines um, would be the best way and the clearest way I think um, to to address that issue. Ms. Wang, you still have the floor with the yeah. motion. Yeah, so in response to that, and I, and I guess, thank, thank you for that, um, Mr. Ellis, is that, you know, that motion to reject is simply on the basis of that misunderstanding and ambiguity of what mulch actually means. And as board member Smirkova also commented on too, is that some changes and some slip lips kind of in between is I, I don't I, I mean I don't think that it's um fair to rule against the applicant which is why I, I'm suggesting um and making the motion to reject staff findings okay so you're agreeing with Mr. Ellis that um the word mulch is more encompassing than um the city's than the zoning administrator had ruled Correct. And does include rock. Correct. Okay. Um, is there a second for that?
Ms. Smakarova, you're seconding the motion? Indeed. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this? Will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Finlayson. He's recusing. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, Board Member Hutchins. Aye. Board Member Johannesson. Nay. Board Member Sandberg. Aye. Board Member Softly. Nay. Board Member Smikarova. Aye. Board Member Wang. Aye. That's four yeas and two nays. So that passes. And so the appeal of the zoning administrator is, uh, um, is granted. And so um, I won't say you can see staff for what your options are. Your appeal is granted and uh, good luck with your project, which I think is done um, as we speak. So. I think that's all the business that we have before us today. Um, unless there's something else, is there any new or old business? Uh, oh, there's a question by Mr. Softley. I, I withdraw my question. Thank you, board uh, chair. Okay. So with that, um, um, I will, um, declare this meeting adjourned. Our next meeting will be November 4th, 2021. Thanks for your time and thanks for everybody who participated. Thank you everyone.